హరే కృష్ణ అధికారం అంటూ వెల్కమ్ బ్యాక్ థ్యాంక్ యూ సో మచ్ ఫర్ కమింగ్ అగైన్ సో సూన్ ఫర్ ద పాడ్కాస్ట్ ఐ థింక్ దిస్ ఇస్ అ వెరీ ఇంపార్టెంట్ టాపిక్ అండ్ వి ఆల్రెడీ గాట్ సమ్ గుడ్ క్వశ్చన్స్ కమింగ్ అప్ సో ది టాపిక్ ఆఫ్ ద వే ఐ టైటల్ ఇట్ వాస్ యు ఆర్ ఈవెన్ థాట్ ఆఫ్ ఇట్ ద స్కోప్ ఆఫ్ శబ్ద బట్ ద వే ఐ టైటల్ ఇట్ వాస్ దట్ ద ప్రత్యక్ష ద శబ్ద ఇన్వాలిడేట్ ప్రత్యక్ష so because that is ultimately the one critical question where this epistemology can be difficult for people so yes. I, i thought i'll quickly do a summary of what we have discussed till now and then excellent we'll thank you so basically the way we started the discussion was uh, that there are these various pramanas for understanding and there is the object of knowledge gnya and pratyaksha anumana shabda three ways of acquiring knowledge or this is one way each of them are their own domain or is shabda the all encompassing body of knowledge which gives us knowledge about everything so that that was the broad question which you started and then you mention about how each pranam praman is valid and the problem is not with the praman itself it is our capacity to access that praman and even with this pratyaksha we are not being given senses just so that we reject them in fact the perfection of the senses is to see perceive spiritual reality and that is vaidush pratyaksha so the praman itself is every praman is valuable and can in, in and properly understood it can be valid and then you also mentioned about how shabda is not just necessarily scripture it is testimony by authority verbal testimony and in a specific sense it refers to the vedas but it can also refer to later on we discussed how even the medicinal text the ayurveda shastra they are also considered to be shabda at one level so ultimately reality is to be pursued from various directions with the various pramanas and the same one reality that we are trying to attain so it's not that it is when we are using our limited capacity then pratyaksha anuman shabda may seem to be divergent and then when shastra scripture talks about emphasizing uh shabda that is because for protection there is natural inf- natural acceptance because we believe what we see and for inference also there is it's based on logic we can infer so anuman is also acceptable as we we trust our brain but for shabda especially because it is uh, based on authority it is not so easy to accept and because it is also mm, about subject matter that are beyond our domain of experience that's why this emphasis on shabda has to be given so that is not meant to necessarily reject pratyaksha anuman it is just to emphasize the both the necessity and the validity of the shabda then so both extremes we, we discuss some quotes about how in or in in its own domain of sensory experience pratyaksha is valid in ordinary experience which is all whose domain ex- extends everywhere in day to day life pratyaksha is what is considered valid so to consider only pratyaksha valid or to consider only shabda valid that is basically the extremes of a pendulum mm-hmm. and then we discuss in our own tradition examples of how pratyaksha is in one sense is used to not so much validate shabda or as to demonstrate shabda to get a deeper understanding of shabda so krishna explains about his opulence and then he demands arjuna requires that the opulence be demonstrated he also mentioned how phalena parichayate that the fruit a thing is known by its fruit prabhupad would speak that so if we or just the principle that any praman by itself can can limit and limit and be limiting applies even to pratyaksha that you, we talked about how there's no way by pratyaksha alone we can know even a country as as populous as china exists or like david hume's point of there is always we can see one event another event but we can it's only through indu- inference induction that we can say there's a causal connection between them so cause and effect is so foundational to our understanding of things but even that cannot be arrived simply by pratyaksha that's why pratyaksha followed by inference anuman <coughs> and then shabda and pratyaksha can both complement each other both can work in synergy that was the theme we were discussing that 
she quoting from jigoswami sarasavadini how shabda does not suffocate pratyaksha anuman and the word darshan can apply to all three things <laughs> literal seeing to inference and to vaidyushi pratyaksha shabda so in one sense shabda and pratyaksha point in the same direction but shabda goes much further <laughs> then we discuss about how shabda comes through some elaborate mechanism for that elaborate analysis of how there is perfection in the message in spite of there being some limitations in the mediums and in the vedic samhitas there is a insistence on literal replication but in puranas the essential meaning is been conveyed and that's why there are variant readings patantar bed and even shukdev goswami is glorified for having added something more that is his this thing the he made it more nectarian and then we were discussing about the domains of how things were so shabda can be transcendental saporishe and tadanugata that which follows that so pratyaksha is needed to receive shabda after all we have to use our senses then we discuss about this again pratyaksha cannot override shabda but shab pratyaksha and shabda can work together so we are going to discuss now this is the idea that this vedanta sutra calls this world as a shabdam that means in one sense shabda is not needed to know this world you know so we will be discussing what he says how to when when there is a conflict between the various pramanas or when can we know shabda has been accessed correctly and also how the pramanas can be brought in dialogue with each other any other points you want to add or contextualize the discussion thank you for that excellent summary pro um your summary uh, is even better than the original presentation so this is uh, this is excellent um i i'll just uh, i'll add two things or emphasize two things i think you already mentioned these uh, but um i want to uh, highlight them a little bit more one is that uh, it sh- it should be uh, mentioned as we did in the last podcast that shabda is still supreme among the uh, pramanas and especially because it gives knowledge beyond human perception um and so whereas the other pramanas have uh human perception and whatever reasoning we build upon that as their limitations uh and this is why the primary scope of shabda is things that are beyond the human level and then this this are metaphysical subjects the second thing uh that i wanted to mention is that uh we can be led astray whenever we take one pramana uh uncritically or exclusive to the others right they each balance each other again this is not a shortcoming in the pramanas themselves uh this is a shortcoming in our ability to assess what is a valid pramana and so uh shabda for example we gave that shabda is um uh when when we when we take shabda to the exclusion of pratyaksha then we are susceptible to accepting any claim to authority uh someone says i am god and we say yes you are god you because you are god everything you say must be the truth that is an uncritical and a incorrect use of shabda but prabhupad explains 11th chapter of gita that we must use our pratyaksha to question that immediately please show me your universal form and if the person can do it then okay we have some more validation uh, similarly as you mentioned with david hume when we take pratyaksha to the exclusion of the others then we can devolve into pure skepticism that's born from exclusive reliance on our senses uh, so shabda without pratyaksha you get uncritical incorrect and blind following is the word prabhupad used to use on a regular basis right that it's blind following and pratyaksha without um shabda becomes a uh, uh, just absurd inquiry absurd uh, skepticism so the prabhupada says both blind following and absurd inquiry are condemned mm. so um yeah so these two points i wanted to highlight uh from uh, the our previous session that uh, shabda supremacy cannot be is is real it's not that the three are in dialogue therefore they are equals uh, shabda is is uh 
retains the, the senior position even as the three rely upon each other. Yes, wrong. Thank you. Yeah. Very clear about that, yeah. So it's it's we can always go to the extremes. You know, sometimes we can see Shabda alone as supreme. Um, but Shabda can also be uh, we can also reject Shabda in the name of calling it so we can sorry, reject everything else. So Shabda is yeah. the highest doesn't mean that everything else is invalid. Exactly. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Please go ahead. Yes, Prabhu. So yeah. now so, so we could discuss about contradictions or so so I was thinking uh, we might um, we might raise the question. The, the next thing I wanted to address was um, this question of um, um, when, when uh, what, how do we know that Shabda's claim to being, to divine descent, to being uh, from a, a reliable, perfect source is true? Uh, because this is a question Jiva Goswami addresses in Sarva Samvadini. Remember last time when we discussed it, there was uh, Shabda's Aparusheya, uh, is coming from a non-material source. It's coming from a non-human source. Uh, therefore, a Purusheya. And then also uh, another aspect of Shabda is trusted human sources uh, for knowledge. There's two levels of Shabda that um, we can distinguish in Jiva Goswami's statements. So this, <clears throat> this we discussed last time. But I guess the million dollar question is, how do we know, right? How do we know that, um, and, and it's a question you've raised also, which is that, is there any internal mechanism within Shabda to, um, uh, to validify its own um, reliability, right? And so I, I think that's the question we want, I want to start with. And then after that, I want to lead to this question of um, what do we do when, um, when uh, Shabda and Pratyaksha directly contradict. Uh, so those, those are the two things I'd like to do in order, and then, and then some final reflections on, on how they work dialogically. Is that okay for a plan, Prabhu? Please, please, yeah, definitely. Okay, okay so, so um, with the first one, um, how do we know about the validity of Shabda? So Shilajiva Goswami, he addresses this question in his Sarva Samvadini, which is basically what we've been following in this uh, conversation with uh, each other. We've been moving towards in this podcast, last part in this part, the various aspects of Jiva Goswami's presentation of the relationship between the Pramanas in his Sarva Samvadini, which is, uh, as a reminder to our listeners, it's the, the, his own commentary or elaboration on the first three Sandarbhas of but, um, the, the Bhagavata Sandarbha or the Shat Sandarbha. So that's where he elaborates on the, the basic things that he lays out in Tattva Sandarbha about the Pramanas. He elaborates a lot on the detailed aspects of that. Uh, and this has been translated very, very nicely by Kopi Pranadhana Prabhu in very clear terms that uh, uh, everyone can understand. So um, then, so the question is uh, how do we know that the scriptures claim to divine descent? is true um, because um, uh, so so I mean the, the typical answer is well because we trust the um, well okay let's put it like this there 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 are in in order to understand the reliability of any source of knowledge you have to use multiple um, you have to use multiple ways of assessing that reliability. Uh, and the more ways in which you can assess that reliability uh, and they come out showing reliability, the, the more confident you can be. So let me give you an, a non-Shastic example. When I teach my students in the university, one of the things I teach them is to assess the reliability of the sources that they are using. Uh, because too often our tendency in our internet world is we have a question, we type it into Google, and Google highlights often an answer at the top uh, or gives you several sources in the first 10 hits and we click on them and we accept them as reliable. But a big part of uh, um, in, uh, academic education and of proper training is to question 
the reliability of the sources you are given, especially in the information age. So I asked them to look at multiple factors in assessing reliability. Uh, one is going to be uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the author, right? Is the author someone who has um, uh, a proper qualification in the subject matter? Do they, have they received training in that area? Uh, um, are they respected by other scholars in that area or are they an outlier? Right? Outliers can be sometimes useful, but one has to be very careful, right? Are they respected by their community of scholar, scholars, um, the community of scholarship? The second thing I asked them to look at is the, the, the place of publication. Uh, who has published this work and therefore has lent their credibility to the subject matter? Uh, I asked them to look at um, uh, their use of prior sources. Who are they citing? for their uh, authority in their writing? Are they claiming that they uh, came up with this overnight uh, in their own mind or in their own brilliance, or are they basing it on prior research uh, that has come up? Uh, and, um, uh, and then, uh, so, so like this, I asked them to assess multiple factors. The one more I would add, Prabhu, to your list is its reception by the community of scholars um, in terms of reliability. So author, place of publication, citation of prior sources, and its reception by uh, the community of scholars. So in this way, um, it's not one factor, but multiple factors that give us confidence because the qualifications of the author are of course very important. But if we rely exclusively on that, there's a chance that we can be fooled, right? Because people get all kinds of PhDs by mail, uh, you just have to pay some money and a company will send you a certificate saying you have a PhD. So technically you could be fooled completely in that area. Uh, any one of these uh, uh, aspects can, can be um, forged, but when you put them all together, then the likelihood of reliability increases significantly. So this is the logic that we want to apply for the pramanas as well, but also particularly for Shabda. If Shabda is, if we think of Shabda in terms of a published paper, right, then we ask ourselves, okay, what are the various, um, actually, from this list, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, the, the fifth item that I want to add to it is that it actually has to make sense to you, right? So <laughs> the, the reader has to go through it and it has to make sense to them. If the person is, is, is um, mad, then, then there's no, there's no like, then, then it becomes highly questionable. If you cannot follow it, if it's incomprehensible, if it's crazy, that kind of thing. So when we look at Shabda, if we think of Shabda with this analogy as a published paper or a published book, and we're trying to assess this reliability, then the first thing that the Shastras ask us to do and the Acharyas ask us to do is to understand the qualifications of the author. Uh, then we want to see its origins. When was it produced? How was it produced? Uh, who was the publisher? Of course, publishers didn't exist back then, but similar circumstances, uh, as in who is putting it out there? Uh, this is presented by Vyasadeva or is it presented by others? Then how is it, how is it in parampara? How is it citing prior sources? Right? Even Krishna and Bhagavad Gita says, according to Vedanta Shruti, this is said. Right? So he's He's using the citation, he's relying on the strength of parampara to substantiate his words, even though he doesn't need to as a Supreme Lord. Uh, but that is a very important element. Then how has it been received by previous acharyas and by the community of sadhus? Uh, this is crucial also. Um, has, have other learned sadhus and teachers and pure devotees looked at the pramana and said, yes, this is good. And this is valuable. And then the final element is, um, does it make sense? Uh, is it self-evident uh, truth? And this is the one that I want to um, highlight. So e each one of these five, basically you could, 
bring down uh, for in relation to Shabda. We could add others also. This is not a comprehensive list. We can add others. But the last one is what Jiva Goswami highlights uh, in, in his Sarva Samvadini. He says that the nature of Shabda, of true, of pure Shabda, is that it is immediately evident to human experience and comprehension. Uh, it is, uh, in Sanskrit, this is called Svata Pramana. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's immediately clear uh, to, yes, this is the truth. And the example he gives is a beautiful story that is given by, uh, or originally by Sripad Shankaracharya, actually, uh, which is the famous story of the 10th. Uh, uh, you are the 10th. Uh, you, you know this story, Prabhu? Should I tell it? You are the tenth. You can repeat it. I think. You know, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so it's a. It's so uh, basically there's there's a, um, a, a guru and his nine disciples who are crossing a river, and it's a dangerous river with uh, heavily the 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 flow is very swift, and so the guru says uh, to the um, uh, he says to the disciples that let us cross carefully and make sure all of us make it to the other side. Uh, so they swim across. And then when they get to the other side, uh, the spiritual master, he says, okay, there were 10 of us. Can one of you count, please, to make sure we are here? And the disciple counts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And he says, Gurudev, there's one missing. And the next disciple cries, uh, 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 counts. And he counts also nine. And he says, yes, my God brother is correct. And they all begin crying that we have lost one God brother in the river. And then the guru steps in. He says, you are fools. You should, uh, you have forgotten to count yourself. You are the 10th, right? And as soon as he says, yes, you are the 10th, then it's immediately clear to their own understanding. You, you, they, um, at, at, them, at that point, the, disi the disciple who was counting, he says, oh yeah, of course, I forgot to count myself, that I am the 10th. Now, there's no evidence needed for this. Uh, at this point, it would be foolish for the disciple to say, Gurudev, can you provide evidence that I am the 10th? No, but it is immediately apparent to human apprehension. Uh, and the example is given like the sun. Uh, uh, this is given by Prabhupada often. The sun reveals everything and it also reveals itself. It is swata pramana. It is self-evident truth. It's self-illuminating. So Jiva Goswami gives this story of the tenth as an example of how Shabda is independent. It's an independent pramana because it is self-evident. Uh, and here again, I want to point out the importance of human apprehension, human comprehension, human experience in validifying Shabda. That the nature of Shabda is that it's, it's, uh, it immediately becomes clear, uh, or sometimes with a little bit of explanation, it becomes clear to the uh, apprehender, right? So this fifth element of sensibility uh, is very important as well. Now, if you take all of these different aspects and you put them together, and uh, they all point to this source's reliability, uh, then you can be fairly sure. Uh, can you still be fooled even when all of these point in the right direction? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, it is possible at any point because we human beings are subject to be uh, to make, make mistakes and to be illusioned. That's our nature. So we can still be fooled even with all these five. And people are. In the academic world, people forge sources that have all these characteristics and they're still fooled. So it is possible even with all these criteria present for us to be misled. Uh, and this has happened in history. Uh, this is why Krishna says, Yogo Nashta Parantapa. But the chances of it become very minimal. Uh, you're basically increasing the probability of reliability uh, through a multi-pronged process of verifying the authenticity of Shabda. You know, this is very rational and persuasive at one level. So one quick point is Swataha Pramana. The way I have heard it before is exactly the opposite. That it does not, it is self-authoritative. It does not require any other authority to explain. Mm -hmm. And if we consider that 
scripture is talking about transcendental subject matters then why there there is domain of uh, existence of that knowledge that is beyond sensory perception so how can something which is inherently beyond sensory perception be self evident to sensory perception no 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 they're not self evident to sensory perception uh they the shabda is beyond sensory perception but it's not beyond our ability to comprehend or experience otherwise uh, what would be the point of shabda if shabda was beyond our ability to comprehend or to experience then sh- that shabda for practical purposes would be useless to human beings point is shabda is directly evident to uh us us meaning ourselves the atma the soul and to some extent our mind and senses but it is not directly evident to our sensory perception and this is why it is called shabda just like the 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 uh, okay so so this is this is a, a an important point because shabda swata pramana i think this is a reason you you bring up that people misunderstand swata pramana and they equate swata pramana as blind following that swata pramana means that it is independent and therefore it should be accepted blindly with no questioning because it is its own pramana but this is not how swata pramana is understood by the acharyas or in vedanta swata pramana means that it establishes its own validity so that to to us it becomes clear that it is truth right that it is it immediately becomes self evident and again both examples make this clear uh jiva goswami's example of the tenth and also propad's example of the sun it is not that someone is telling us that there is a black hole and now you have to accept it that's swata pramana you cannot perceive it but you have to accept it no it is that it is swata pramana because it is immediately clear once it is pointed out to you once it is once you see it it becomes immediately clear it becomes uh you understand its truth and a wonderful example of this is the reality of consciousness right consciousness is the fundamental uh, element of swata pramana you cannot perceive consciousness through any sensory perception of any kind it is beyond that you can perceive the heart you can perceive the brains you can perceive all kinds of things but you cannot use an instrument to measure consciousness and yet when the reality of consciousness is pointed out by the guru aham brahmasmi right you are you are transcendental spirit you are consciousness you are the atma it becomes immediately clear to the uh, to the sincere listener right it becomes uh, self evident that is swata pramana it is not that swata pramana means it will never be evident to you you just have to accept blindly that is a misunderstanding of swata pramana good point about reality of consciousness it is uh, this consciousness is the basis by which we know everything because the consciousness is known by not known by sensory perception but sensory perception is actually known through consciousness yes there would not be any perception at all through senses also now <clears throat> two points over here first is that uh, in the christian tradition i have read there are two categories is rational theology and this revelational theology that uh, <clears throat> some aspects of say for example the in- existence of god can be inferred hmm? but beyond that specifics there are many specifics which cannot be inferred there is more of revelational theology so now the existence of consciousness itself we could say can be inferred but further spiritual details say for example god is a bluish black coward boy who plays a peacock who plays a fluid fluid and wears a peacock feather now that is not something which can be it's not exactly swataha pramana is in fact shastra yonitvat when the vedanta sutra says the idea is that that it is only by shastra brahma can be known that it cannot be known by pratyaksha brahma that's at least some way, one way in which the that verse is understood that the source of everything janma adhyasyata it can be understood only through shastra or maybe primarily through shastra you can elaborate on that but it's not that everything in shabda is self evident so is it that there is some differentiation there are some there are some principles which are self evident and then specifics 
they are more a matter of um, matter of inference based on that mm-hmm. because again like the earlier ch- lines of authority that we use it is when we are evaluating a particular author's writings now we can see how much it makes sense to me but that doesn't mean that if everything made sim- immediate sense then what is the point of learning we don't have anything to learn from that person exactly mm-hmm. very nice point bro very nice point so swata pramana some things are immediately swata pramana uh we can say um but also we can push that further and say that everything is swata pramana in due course so for example for the vaishnav who is seeing krishna sakshat then um there is no external evidence needed for krishna's existence uh, krishna is swata pramana because he is there uh, antar bahir avasthitam he is right there in the so for prahlad the lord's existence was swata pramana uh, uh, hiranyakashipu asked him uh, is 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 uh, your lord here in this pillar for uh, um hiranyakashipu it was a matter of evidence right let me break the pillar and see if the lord is actually in the pillar but for prahlad it was swata pramana uh, he it was immediately evident no external evidence was needed that the lord is in the pillar he looks at the pillar and the lord is there in other words back to our definition of swata pramana that the 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 fact of it was immediately available to his apprehension to his comprehension immediately just like you are the 10th it was immediately clear so but for hiranyaka shipu it was not swata pramana so this is also the point that swata pramana everything in shabda is swata pramana but perhaps not immediately some things like uh, the reality of consciousness can be immediately swata pramana even for the average person and prabhupat would begin his lectures by this point you are not this body you are the soul because this is swata pramana even for the average thoughtful person but other things take time mm. now the question here comes up uh, to fold is that if something is a swata pramana for you and not for me so swata so, pramana to it does not do away with the need for shraddha shraddha is still required because some things may be self evident but some things are not it's there is something for me to build the foundation of my faith on but still faith is like a leap into the unknown to some extent e- either the faith is a leap into the unknown um and i agree to some extent it is but also shab- uh, shraddha or faith is basically those various those five characteristics that we uh, put up 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 there right it's it's the in our notes it's it's the it's the composite of that what is shraddha except reliance on uh, other authorities who have better understanding like just like i'm reading an article and like you said it may not be sensible to me immediately uh, it may be in fact quite confusing but i have trust that because my professor has assigned this article or because many scholars regard this as a seminal piece of writing therefore i must struggle through it understand it so, until it becomes sensible for me right so what is that but placing my shraddha in the community of scholars or teachers or gurus who have seen value in that piece of shabda so shraddha in, on one level is simply a composite it's a conglomeration of all those factors that we put up which is our trust in the author and the qualifications of the author our trust in the community of teachers who accept this as reliable our trust in the origin the publisher the source of this knowledge right all of these things put together comprise our shabda uh, our shraddha and if you start pulling away one of these one after another and the author turns out to be unreliable the community it turns out to be fools all of that then eventually our shraddha will crumble it it should crumble and if it doesn't crumble then it, it means it is blind faith uh, which is not actually shraddha shraddha is not blind faith right so uh so in some sense yes uh, the the sensibility may be uh, uh, unknown that may be a leap but the other factors have to be there to ground it otherwise then just a leap into the unknown might lead us into a ditch yeah so then when we say shabda it is not necessarily 
a fixed corpus of books. Again, I'm taking Christian examples because that that and I think this field has been researched. In different Christian denominations, there are different books which are included in the Bible. Some books are included as the as the Bible, and some some them are not included. There's some which are core, which everybody includes. So what? So there won't be a overarching, universally accepted definition of shabda by all traditions, or is there? No, no. Every every uh, collection of shabda, the scriptural canon. has to be specific to the community uh which which adheres to it this is why when you begin any kind of discussion uh in in uh, vedic culture then you always begin by uh, establishing a shared pramana what are your pramanas what are mine because unless there's an ex- agreement on pramanas we will be talking past each other right so this is why uh, you know in the chand kazi leela uh, uh, prabhupad mentions he says that when the muslims are quoting from their quran then their uh, then their um, arguments are authorized and when we are quoting from the vedas then our arguments are authorized we have to have a proper pramana a shabda pramana to base it on now every community feels that their pramana is universally applicable that's a fact right we feel the vedas are universally ap- applicable the christians feel the bible is universally applicable but in practice the shraddha is really dependent upon or is or is not dependent it's invested in a particular group a particular collection of works uh that are known as the scriptural canon or or the the shabda pramana for that community and propat makes it clear that when that shabda pramana is 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 accepted in a particular community then their their arguments are are authorized now we can question each other's pramanas for validity that is our right uh, but within each community that there are certain pramanas that will be universally accepted by that uh, tradition but you but the vedas for example are accepted as as praman by all traditions at least those traditions which are considered as uh, astic yes so exactly so the vedas have the widest uh, acceptance within india within the ved uh, indic traditions but still not universal right but they have the widest acceptance as you said amongst the astika not the nastika traditions and then within that you can have then there become more specific uh, um shabda praman that are accepted more narrowly so for example one community may accept the shiva puran as shabda praman uh, and another community may not accept for us uh, shrimad bhagavatam is apaurushaya right jiva goswami makes this clear it is shabda praman of the highest category uh, whereas for uh, other sampradayas non vaishnav sampradayas in particular bhagavatam may be part of pramana shabda praman but it will not be apaurushaya it's uh, is in the category of uh, human author texts that are generally reliable uh, but not don't have carry the absolute reliability of the vedas Whereas Jiva Goswami makes it clear that uh, for Bhagavatam has the absolute reliability of the Vedas, so pramanas are going to be assessed. Shabda praman is going to be assessed differently by different communities uh, uh, of uh, teachers and different sampradayas. This also brings in, uh, while we could actually say that the various traditions are pointing to the ultimate same ultimate truth, the fact that they have different sources of authority and then they draw different inferences from the teaching of those sources of authority that does bring in a certain level of almost irreducible subjectivity to the perception of reality so so when we say that what is the rigvedic saying ekam satvi prabahuda vadanti hmm? that one truth is known by multiple names so it we can say that the principle applies not just to names that can also apply to broader perceptions of reality also yes and and i would i would i agree prabhu and i would modify that just slightly by saying it's not irreducible subjectivity but we might say there are different areas of knowledge and different ways of understanding that truth one nice example i like to give in this regard this ekam sat idea is that it is often said 
uh, that in the beginning of the um, creation, Lord Shiva did his dance with the Damaru. And this dance uh, was heard by three different sages. Patanjali uh, heard it and he uh, listened to the dance and he understood the, uh, uh, the poses and the, and the understanding of, of uh, yoga sutras. And uh, uh, the um, Bharatamuni heard it and he heard the rhythms and notes of the Natya Shastra. And, uh, and um, the third one, I think, is uh, Panini. He heard it and uh, he heard the, um, uh, the uh, uh, letters of the al- alphabet, the aksharas, from which he created uh, the um, Ashtadhyayi, the Sanskrit grammar. So that same truth uh, is uh, accessed in different ways by different sages over time. Uh, this is not to say that every apprehension of every understanding of the of the of shabda is correct. Uh, there is also incorrect understandings that are misapprehensions of that reality. And to to clarify those misapprehensions, there's been a long tradition of shastrartha, the debate between um, uh, acharyas of different sampradayas, where they debate the validity of their pramanas as well as the conclusions that they can draw from those pramanas. The debates between the Vedanta Acharyas are especially uh, robust because they have a shared set of pramanas. So they can they, they don't have to di- di- uh, discuss that first. The, the pramanas are already accepted, the prasthanatrayi, and then they can discuss what the pramanas are actually concluding. When there's debate outside of the Vedantic circle, then you have to begin even with the discussion of the pramanas themselves. Are the Vedas reliable or not as forms of authority. Mm. It's interesting one. I think in the, there could also be a different ways of understanding, but it's also evolutionary. You, it could, there could also be evolution in understanding. The Bhagavatam says that when Brahmaji heard the, read the Vedas for the first time, he thought they were teaching Karma Marga. Then he heard, read for the second time, he thought this Jnana Marga. And then he read it for the third time, then he understood it was bhakti. So there could also be evolution yes. in yes. that person's understanding also. Yes. Mm-hmm. So if there are different ways of understanding, not just the one ultimate reality, but even we're not talking about ontology, we're talking about epistemology over here, that there could be different understandings of what are the ways to understand, or different understandings of the tools with which we are going to understand the books. Then, in one sense, there is never going to be one conclusive understanding ever. Because there, there, if there is no agreement on the tools for knowing, how would you ever be able to arrive at one conclusive understanding? Or will it be, will it be that something like different tools would be used for arriving at, like for establishing Siddhanta, so, for example, Mahaprabhu would use scripture to debate with his uh, Asnik traditions. And then he would use logic tarka to deal with uh, debate with those who are Nastic traditions. So, sometimes we may have to use the appropriate uh, source of knowledge or appropriate source of knowing for establishing establishing the truth in particular circles. Like when you quoted that Mahaprabhu and Chankazi both using their own scriptures, wouldn't that itself lead to talking past each other? Mm -hmm. Because each person doesn't accept their other other source of authority, then would would, uh, would inference, would would Pratyaksha Anandwan become like a shared source of authority for everyone? Or how would that kind of uh, logjam be avoided. Hmm. You're absolutely right. Unless there's a shared pramanas, uh, there's there's going to be talking past each other. And therefore, in the situation where Shabda Pramana cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, shared, cannot be mutually accepted, say when they're, we're doing interfaith dialogue, then it's unlikely that they are going to accept our pramanas and we're going to accept theirs uh, in terms of Shabda Pramana. 
then often the realm of dialogue uh, happens to be protection anuman, right? That, and, and this doesn't need to be superficial because remember the devotee's perception, understanding, experience of Krishna is also pratyaksha. And, and this, this can become a very rich location for dialogue because um, we often find, I mean, my own experience is that when people of faith from different traditions speak about their direct apprehension of God, we find many shared commonalities that are present there, as well as commonalities within the pramanas themselves, right? That are, uh, uh, that are apprehensible to anuman, to logic. Your, prama, your shastra also restricts the animal slaughter. My shastra also restricts. So this is understanding validity through anumana, right? We may not accept each other's pramanas, but we recognize that within the pramanas, there are logical elements or experiential elements or devotional elements that are shared uh, and that uh, point to the same ultimate reality. And that's where I think dialogue becomes truly fruitful and possible when we recognize that this person, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur said so nicely, that this person uh, is perceiving my own Lord in a different way. And my own appreciation for my Lord has become enriched by seeing him manifest in this unique way in this person's tradition. So you recognize the same reality, but perceived and understood differently in a different tradition. And that avoids the talking past each other element, despite the fact that we don't share the same pramanas from a formal uh, textual perspective. So you could say here there is something like an experience of the divine that is sensed. Would that be, I mean, for example, Sanatana Goswami in the Brihad Bhagavatam also talks about Anubhav as one of the pramanas, experience. Hmm. So would that, by that experience, I don't think we are referring to protection. How does that fall in his talk? I think he's talking about the story of the Gop Kumar. The Gop Kumar goes to the spiritual world, goes to various levels in the spiritual world, Vaikunthe, Ayodhya, Dwarka, then comes back to earth, then goes to the earthly Vrindavan and attains the spiritual Vrindavan. So their Anubhav is, the Anubhav is considered as a, a key marker, key, uh, key aid in, di in direction finding. So yeah. where does, is that what something you are referring, something similar to what you are referring to here? Yes, yes, Prabhu. So, so there's actually often given a list of 10 pramanas, and I don't know the 10 off the top of my head, but Anubhav is one of them. Aitihya or tradition, uh, uh, customary tradition is also one of these pramanas and so on. And, and Jiva Goswami um, uh, reduces these 10 into the large, larger three categories of Shabda, Pratyaksha, and Anuma. Yes, so yes. when I speak of Pratyaksha, I'm including uh, Anubhav in it also. And when I speak of Shabda, I'm including Aitihya in it also. So uh, we, can, we, can more, we can separate these out more precisely uh, if we had the, the, the information here, um, but we yeah. could divide them out. But the, basically all the different means of knowing that are useful and valid, uh, the Vedantists, they reduce to these three. Okay. Hmm. But uh, I'm a little bit conscious of our time, Prabhu. Yeah, uh, yeah, should Prabhu. we... I think we're going to go ahead. There are multiple questions that may keep coming up, but this is just a very reasonable foundational clarity we have come to. I think one key question would be, do you want to talk about where Shabda and Pratyaksha seem to contradict? Yes. Okay. Yes. I definitely want to get to that here in this point. So when Thakur talks about it, addresses this in his essay on the Bhagavad, you know, he talks about two main things chronology and cosmology with specifically with respect to the Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. So the dates given in the Bhagavatam for particular kings and particular yugas that can seem almost unbelievable and the cosmology and the specific dimensions. So I think chronology is important but that is that is an issue which we have discussed in our very first podcast or the dating of scriptures. And why dating should be considered? Is it is it that important in our tradition when it's talking about timeless principles? So maybe we can focus on cosmology. Hmm. Is that okay? True. Oh, yes. Yes. Very nice. Um, so uh, what happens when pratyaksha and 
uh, Shabda contradict. Uh, so uh, let me begin by saying that um, uh, Jiva Goswami, he says that when scripture, Shastra speaks of the physical domain, then it has several functions. Right? There, in other words, when Pratyaksha and Shabda interact with each other, they meet each other, there's three things, he says, uh, that can happen uh, from a faithful perspective. One is that um, Shastra provides the foundation for good Anuman, right? So by this, I mean, you know where to begin your reasoning or where to end your reasoning or in what direction to move your reasoning because Anumana without direction can become extreme, um, uh, very uh, kind of all over the place. Uh, very misdirected and um, uh, very uh, uh, inco incoherent, right? Uh, it's not properly directed. Uh, so he says the fir first thing is that it, it Shabda provides a foundation for good Anuman, for good inference, uh, good logic. Second, uh, Shabda can be supported by Pratyaksha, right? So we, Sh Shastra says X, Shastra says that uh, um, the uh, Prabhupada gives the example of uh, the, the stool of all animals is impure, but the stool of the cow is pure. So this is uh, a statement by Shastra uh, about something in this physical world, but we can support it by Pratyaksha. Apparently, there's been studies done showing that uh, cow dung has uh, antiseptic properties, and of course, it has fertilizing properties, and so on. So uh, in this case, Pratyaksha supports Shabda. And then the third instance is the one that we are primarily in interested in. These first two are rather easy. Uh, the third one is when Shabda overrules uh, Pratyaksha and the other Pramanas. Okay. Um, so... Uh, that is the one that we are particularly concerned with, is what happens when there's a direct contradiction. So Jiva Goswami addresses this actually quite um, directly. Um, what uh, happens when the uh, scriptures seem implausible from a physical standpoint? So in order to address, explain how Jiva Goswami addresses this, let me first uh, point out that uh, for our listeners that there, are, um, uh, that there are two types of meaning uh, explanation. Actually, there's more, but there's two for our purposes. Vedantists agree that there are literal meaning of scripture and uh, uh, indirect meaning, uh, indirect interpretation. So one is called the Mukhya Vritti, or the uh, sometimes called um, Rudhi also, the direct meaning of uh, a passage, the literal meaning. And then there is uh, the indirect interpretation called Lakshana. When, uh, in general, the principle of interpretation is that we should always begin with the Mukhya Vritti, with the direct interpretation. And when that uh, direct interpretation is not plausible, then we can move to the indirect interpretation. Okay. And uh, the various um, Vedantists, they explain that um, uh, when the primary meaning of the direct meaning is obstructed, uh, badha, uh, means it does not make sense in relation to the, uh, to the other words of the sentence, the, other, the, the larger paragraph or chapter or the text, or when it does not make sense in relation to what we know about this world. These are the two uh, situations when a meaning is badha, it is obstructed, which can prompt going from a direct to an indirect meaning. 
Okay? So the when the direct meaning is implausible, namely, badha, namely, when it is does not make sense within its own text, right, within its own context. And then uh, secondly, when it is um, doesn't make sense in relation to our experience of the world. Then we have to go to the indirect meaning. Uh, that indirect meaning needs to be tad yoga, which means it must be connected with the primary sense. The indirect meaning cannot be off the wall. It cannot be just a, a brilliant uh, twist of our imagination. The secondary meaning, although it's indirect, it must be connected to the direct meaning in a, in a, in a regular and obvious way. There should be linguistic and conceptual similarities between them. What do you yoga. Mean linguistic similarities? It should, be a, it, is, it should be a reasonable secondary reading. Is that what you're trying to say? It, it has to be connected to the primary meaning. Right, so the indirect metaphorical or indirect in understanding cannot be just uh, uh, completely disconnected from the original primary meaning that did not work. Hmm. So the classic example of this is uh, in um, uh, in interpretation is is uh, the famous Gangayam Ghoshaha, right? The village on the Ganges. So the village on the Ganga is uh, the Primary meaning is badha, is obstructed because it does not match with our experience. Uh, our experience is that human habitation cannot exist on the flow of the river, Ganga Pravahe. That doesn't make any sense. Therefore, Ganga Tate, we have to add the idea of Tata, of the shore. And that meaning is Tad Yoga. It's connected to the first meaning. Uh, in other words, it's clearly related to the idea of a village on the Ganga. Uh, I'm saying instead of in the middle of the Ganga, it's on the edge of the Ganga. In other words, I cannot come up with a new meaning that says, actually, the Ganga refers to the flow of the heart and our connection to the divine. And therefore, Gangayam Ghosha means a village that is connected to my heart. Uh, that's no, it's it's not Tad Yoga. It's not connected to the primary meaning. It's too much <laughs> out of the ordinary, right? Okay, so this is this is the um, this is the the foundation uh, of of understanding to understand what Jiva Goswami then explains. So, what does he say? He says first of all, it is entirely possible for shabda and pratyaksha or shabda and anuman to conflict with each other. In such a situation of conflict, shabda is always supreme. It overrules the others. But at the same time, we have to make sense of Shabda with our own minds and experience, right? We have to be able to understand it and appreciate it. So here's the examples that he gives of Shabda conflicting with Pratyaksha. Okay. And I think these examples will illuminate. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Shabda can conflict with Pratyaksha and Shabda is always supreme in such a situation. But the question then occurs is how do we understand that Shabda, that scriptural statement that is conflicting with our experience? And here is where Jiva Goswami's examples are brilliant. He says, he gives the example of Gangayam Ghosha, village on the Ganga. He gives the example in the Vedas which say that the waters spoke, right? The jala, the waters spoke. Another example he gives is the Vedas saying that the stones float. In each of these, he says, even though it conflicts with our immediate experience, we can make sense of the, um, uh, the meaning of these statements uh, in relation to our experience in the following way. He says, uh, in the first instance, Gangayam Gosha is the, the idea of a human habitation is implausible. Therefore, we add Gangayam Tate on the banks of the Ganga. In the second instance of the water spoke, he says, uh, our observation is that water doesn't normally speak, right? And therefore, this prompts the reinterpretation by Jiva Goswami, 
that this refers to the demigod presiding over water as speaking. Mm. Okay. The, in the third instance, he says, again, the idea that stones can float is unreasonable in typical human experience. Uh, but, he says, the scriptures praise the stones by saying the stones float in order to increase the potency of the stones that are used in a particular ritual. Uh, this is from Mimamsa. Mm -hmm. That this is by increasing the shakti of the stones, by praising them for the purpose of the, the performance in a particular ritual. This is a functionalist explanation, functionalist interpretation of this statement. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jiva, uh, Jiva Goswami actually refers to the Ramayana story in this regard that the shakti of the stones can be increased, uh, but uh, just like when the, um, they, they built the bridge, the, the, the Vanaras built the bridge across the ocean for Lord Ramachandra. So uh, let me point out here that in the, in the water spoke example, Jiva Goswami is explaining the meaning by adding one element, namely the devas, just like we added the bank, uh, of the Ganga, right, which was not present in the original statement, in order to explain how some, something that is implausible to human experience can in fact become plausible. And the stones float, he offers a functionalist interpretation in order to explain why the scriptures say something that is seemingly beyond or, or contradictory to human experience. But the, here's the key point. Every one of these explanations is prompted by an attempt to make it reasonable to Pratyaksha, right? It's, it's prompted by an attempt to reconcile with an opposing Pratyaksha. Mm -hmm. While respecting the primary meaning of the passage. So Jiva Goswami is not saying that stones float, here the stones refer to the human capacity to, to uh, you know, the, the fact that that we are like stones and the Lord can lift us up uh, by his power. So this stone is a metaphorical way of referring to the human being. He's not saying something like that. He's not saying that the water spoke is referring to our inner voice because our inner, our heart is, flows like water. Therefore, our inner voice speaks. <laughs> He's not saying like this. Every interpretation is directly connected to the primary meaning. He's not going way off into never, never land. Right into some metaphorical uh, reality. No, it's closely connected to the primary meaning, but it is prompting a reinterpretation in order to respect our direct perception. Uh, let me just emphasize, Prabhu, uh, one last thing, which is to say that yeah, I was thinking that when you're speaking these, at one level, the principles, the examples might seem a bit trivial. It's mm -hmm. a, a simple example. I mean, it's a straightforward understanding for anybody who knows was read Shastra. But the last point that you made was that the, in the, the attempt in all of these, the underlying driving principle is to make Shabda intelligible to our Pratyaksha Anuman. To that, I think that brings a certain level of responsibility to every generation in the tradition. Because we could say that knowledge of the world um, is evolving. And then in the, and this will bring us a big subject as the knowledge of the world evolves, then in the light of that evolving knowledge, how is the knowledge revealed in scripture to be seen? Uh, making scripture intelligible to a contemporary generation would become the responsibility of that contemporary generation's scholars or teachers. Exactly. 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 And, and this is a very important Prabhu, not just Vedic principle, it's a Vaishnava principle specifically, because unlike some other Vedantist schools, we regard this world to be true, to be satyam, to be real. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not say it's mithya, right? We don't say it's false. We don't say it's, it's vyavaharika only. We say it is actually real because it's the Lord Shakti. So by suffocating pratyaksha and our ability to understand it, we are disrespecting our own philosophy significantly. In fact, when our Acharyas, specifically when Jiva Goswami, when they argue against Mayavad philosophy, one of the, the foundational arguments they make 
is that it contradicts our direct experience. Because you are saying that this world is not real, it's not substantial. It's only temporarily real, it's not vyavaharic. But this contradicts our direct perception. Our perception is that this world is real and these differences are real. So by saying that you are me and I am you, or by saying that the world is insubstantial, you are going against the foundational experience of human beings, their direct perception. And therefore, such a philosophy, however brilliant it may be, on the level of interpretation, it cannot be true because it contradicts fundamental human experience. And this relies on our conviction that this world is true. It's satya. It's not false. It's not fake. And so this respect for pratyaksha, let me emphasize, is a distinctly Vaishnav imperative. It is not simply us trying to uh, sell out or become weak in the face of science. It's not simply a a uh, you know a, uh, like um, um, wishy washy watered down idea. No, this is this is the heart of it's, it's one of the most important aspects of our philosophy that distinguishes us from Mayavad. Right? Is the Acharya's insistence that our experience of the world has to be taken seriously. Mm. So I suspect that we may have to have one more session now. This has been quite uh, demanding as well as uh, illuminating. But this last point which you mentioned about uh, our experience of our senses, our experience of the world being relied on, I would say it is in one sense, uh, again, foundational to bhakti because we constantly use our senses. We don't consider our senses to be maya. In bhakti itself, we use our senses. So just as our senses can be used to perceive Krishna in the sense of his deities, his holy name. So senses can also be used to perceive Krishna in this world, to understand Krishna's presence and the realities of this world also to some extent. Another point I was thinking that within our tradition, time is also considered to be divine. Mm-hmm. So, we are not just adjusting according to time, you know, we are also trying to attune ourselves to how Krishna is revealing wisdom through time. Because the changes of the world and whatever results from the changes of the world is not just completely random. It is also God acting through the agency of time in the world. So, mm-hmm. it's not just adjusting to time, it's adjusting to Krishna who is manifesting through time. Mm-hmm. Both points are beautifully stated, Prabhu. I really, really appreciate it. Especially this point about bhakti not rejecting the senses. How many times does Prabhupada make that point? Right? What will repression accomplish over and over and over again? That these senses are so valuable engagement in bhakti and not merely stepping stones to be rejected. Uh, they have to be transformed and we will always have senses now and in the spiritual world. So our pratyaksha is never useless, right? It's always valid. I, I, think, I think one example of this applied, the waters spoke, the stones float. I think one example of this applied in our current context uh, that concerns devotees today is I think when we discuss these elements of cosmology that you were mentioning, right? That, that cosmology can often, the Bhagavatam's cosmology can contradict on the surface, apparently, very significantly with uh, A, what we actually perceive up in the sky by our own senses, and B, what modern science tells us through its usage of scientific calculations, telescopes, and things of that nature, right? It can seem like it's an affront to both our immediate perception and the extended perception of the scientific community, Pratyaksha. But this is where I think the work of scholars and devotees like Sadaputta Prabhu are so valuable, right? Like Sadaputta Prabhu's, for example, explanation of the relative distances of the sun and the moon, as well as uh, the plane of the Bhumandala that he gives as the plane of the solar system. I, I find them so wonderful because they allow me to understand what the Bhagavatam is saying 
and also make sense of it in terms of human perception, right? In terms of our ability to look up into the sky and to understand things. Uh, this is a, an excellent example of how the two are properly respected in the mood of Srila Jiva Goswami. Of course, uh, Sadaputta Prabhu himself was clear that his conclusions were tentative. He was not presenting it as the absolute truth. He gave multiple models for making sense of the Bhagavatam's cosmology in relation to uh, scientific perception. Uh, not just scientific perception, in, in relation to the perception even of the rishis uh, in terms of this sky. Uh, he gave multiple models that are there. Um, yeah. but, but still, I find that kind of attempt to be very laudable and very reasonable. Um, and of course, it was greatly desired by Srila Prabhupada also yeah. in the creation yeah. of Bhaktivedanta yeah. Institute. In, the, in Shri Prabhupada's letter to when the planetary was being constructed, he said, you need to be able to explain the phases of the moon, you need to be able to explain eclipses, seasons. So basically, what the Bhagavad Cosmology is describing, Prabhupada also wanted to make it intelligible in terms of our sensory experience, especially in terms of some key parameters that are used in empirical observation of cosmology. Or that are empirical effects of cosmological structures or systems. Yes. So this so now the specifics of how which aspects of Shabda can be can be made intelligible to Pratyaksha, that may be like we mentioned Sadavut Rose's book, that is a formidable intellectual task, and he's done it. He was equal to it. But it's a it's a significant responsibility. And probably we could say that. Our tradition and specifically our movement is relatively young right now. So just because we don't have questions which have been answered does not necessarily mean that the questions have no answers and doesn't mean that we have to either give up Shabda or we have to give up protection. Hmm. Is it, uh, maybe this is the last question we could discuss that sometimes we say that you know, as devotees we can suspend judgment as sadhakas. No. Okay, I, I don't know how this makes sense. So I can't say that I accept it, but I don't say that I reject it either. Also. You know, this is something which I may have to figure out. And suspending judgment is something which we do in various areas of life. A student who starts studying quantum physics, hardly anything makes sense initially. But okay, I suspend judgment about a theoretical model. This mathematics seems to make seem, seems to be working. Let me focus on that. So is there something within the tradition to substantiate this idea of suspending judgment? Now, the concept of chintatva is there, but I don't think that's the relevant uh, concept here. Maybe we could have a separate session on what achintya means and what it doesn't mean. But the idea of suspending judgment, would you um, say that that's, a, that's one way of approaching where we cannot immediately reconcile, we cannot, we cannot make sense of shabda in terms of protection? Hmm. I mean, suspending judgment is the very heart of Shraddha, right? If everything made sense, uh, then, and we were able to explain everything, then we would have no need for Shabda, uh, for Shraddha. We would just have Anuman only, uh, because everything was making sense to our logic. But the idea that we have to, or, or we'd only have Pratyaksha, Pratyaksha and Anuman would suffice, in other words. But the heart of Shraddha is our ability to say, that although I understand that Shabda, Pratyaksha, and Anuman all come to the same point in their perfection. This comes back to the beginnings of our, of our discussion uh, last time. Right? That they're all pointing to the same reality. And in their ultimate sense, they're all three are perfect. Pratyaksha is perfect, uh, as Vaidusha Pratyaksha. Anuman is perfect in terms of the logic that helps us understand reality. And Shabda is perfect as revealed knowledge from the Lord. But given my own limitations of understanding, I cannot understand them fully. Therefore, I'm going to suspend judgment until that point when it is revealed or I'm able to understand, right? That's the very heart of Shabda. Without that, there's no, there's no need even for Shabda, right? So suspending judgment is the very heart of what we do as, as, uh, as devotees. And and, uh, and 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 uh, and when it comes to to various, I mean, I, I can say from a personal perspective, when it comes to cosmology 
and things of that nature, not being a scientist and not having the time, capacity, energy to study cosmology from a highly technical perspective, there's a lot of suspending judgment that I do when it comes to cosmology, right? Uh, but what, when, as much as I need to keep my shraddha, I, I take. And so, for example, reading sections of Vedic cosmography and astronomy by Sadaputta Prabhu, uh, this is as much as I need for me to understand, yes, this is reasonable, it's reliable, right? I can accept it. Uh, I, I want to make just one, one last point uh, on this matter, which is to say that I think we have to recognize that throughout our entire Vaishnav and Vedic history, there has never been one Acharya who has taken the cosmology of the Puranas or of the Vedas or of Bhagavatam, described it, closed their eyes and said, I will not look up into the sky because I accept it fully on truth, uh, on Shabda. No, our predecessor Acharyas and uh, scientists and astrologers were incredible observers of our cosmos. They measured the movements of the planets. They measured the locations of the stars. They observed, they predicted eclipses with exceeding accuracy. They, they timed the rising and setting of the sun. All of these things they did. Uh, we know this because astrology requires all of these calculations, right? So we know that ancient Vedic astronomy was very advanced and very, they were very careful observers of this world. And yet they held faith in the Shastras at the same time. My point is no one asks us to have faith in the Shastras to the exclusion of the other Pramanas. No, throughout our history, we see a robust dialogue between the Pramanas of the Acharyas making sense of the Shastras and looking up into the sky and making sense of what they see and bringing those two things together, right? And, and if they can't bring the two things together, still they don't think that they have to choose between one of them. Exactly. So for example, I think Chakravarti Pad, Shana Pad talks about the horoscope of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and of Krishna. And that horoscope is entirely described based on uh, the, uh, the Jyotish Shastras. And he, the Jyotish Shastras cosmology is not so easy to reconcile with the Bhagavatam's cosmology. So he's commenting on the Bhagavatam. He's commenting on the cosmology section of the Bhagavatam also. But when he has to do astrology, he does use the Jyotish Shastra, not the Bhagavatam. Yes. So, so, so sometimes, what is that saying? You know, trying to be more, more Catholic than the Pope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we we may think that being faithful to Shastra requires requires a level of rejection or protection that has not that has not been demanded by the tradition. Exactly. Exactly. This is very well put, Prabhu. This is beautifully put, what you just said. That, that sometimes we think that an acceptance of Shabda requires a rejection of the other Pramanas that has not been demanded by our tradition, not been demonstrated by our tradition either. But somehow we demand it of ourselves. right? And, and I think we are being unfair to ourselves. The only people we are harming are ourselves. Because the tradition has a dialogical model of the Pramanas. And, and that, I think, is key to keep in mind. That dialogue between the pramanas may not always be perfect, right? There may be conflicts. There may be areas you don't understand. But no one is dumping one pramana in favor of the others. They're always in uh, dialogue with each other. And whatever aspect of the dialogue is most important to you, you investigate that thoroughly, right? So if cosmology is your area where that dialogue is most uh, uh, most uh, difficult, then please investigate that dialogue between Pratyaksha, Anuman, and Shabda in relation to cosmology. For me, this is not my area of angst. It's not my area of concern. I, I appreciate it, and I get into it a little bit as much as I need, but I'd only need a little bit. My area of dialogue between the Pramanas has to do with history and dating and texts 
like we discussed in previous podcasts. So I get deep into that. But some of my uh, fellow Vaishnav scholars will get deep into the area of cosmology. That is the area where the dialogue is important for them. So we are limited human beings. Whatever area of dialogue is crucial for you, you take that seriously. And re not rejecting any of the pramanas, find a way to respect the supreme authority of Shabda while integrating the other pramanas within that understanding that in a way that respects their validity also and investigate that area and other areas will be investigated by others. Thank you, Prabhu. This is a very intellectually reasonable and I would say for many reassuring explanation of the bhag of epistemology of Shabda. So I'll try to do a quick summary. Yes, Prabhu. So, so we started by discussing about the a times when basically two main topics were discussed. The topic was about, at, started by talking about how Shabda is considered supreme, but at the same time, when Shabda, Shabda also has to make sense to our perceptions also, we discussed one was the authenticity of Shabda. How mm -hmm. do we know that? And that for that, just as how do we know authenticity of anything? of any, any piece of writing. We look at the author, we look at the publication, we look at the uh, previous sources cited, we look at the reception, we look at the, mm, look at the logic, look at the coherence, sensibility. So same way, Shabda also like, is it like that. We, that is, is it coming in scripture, is quoted by, it is written by people with great character. It is accepted by the community of scholars. Then one key point, this is Swataha Pramana. That was something elaborate we discussed. Swataha Pramana doesn't mean self, it doesn't mean evident to self-perception, but self evident sensory perception, but self-evident, like the reality of consciousness. And things which are in the domain of Swataha Pramana will also increase as we grow spiritually. Mm -hmm. So then we discussed about the conflict and the idea is that this, when there is conflict, it is not that one praman has to be rejected for the other. Uh, the principle that Jiva Goswami so sometimes Lakshana Vritti may have to be used instead of uh, the uh, instead of the direct Vritti, Mukhya Vritti. And when it is used, it has to be in connection. It has to be connected. It should be actually Lakshana Vritti is required in two contexts when it doesn't a textual context, it doesn't make sense or empirical context, it doesn't make sense. Very nice put. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. Mm -hmm. So when it doesn't, when it doesn't make sense and the, the, when there's a reasonable con connection and then you give the two, three examples of the river on the, of the village on the river or the water speaking or the snow stones floating. The idea is we make Shabda intelligible to protection and specifically how to do that that is something which uh, every generation, the evolution of knowledge will have to do. And uh, we do it, we suspend judgment as a matter of Shraddha. And whichever areas are important for us, we work on it. We associate with those who are working on it. And as per uh, our need, that can be evolved. So this is the, the dialogue between them has to, uh, can be evolving. It doesn't have to be one conclusive or perfect understanding of how the two come together. But the underlying principle is there is it's not that one has to be rejected for the other. And how the two can be brought together, that can be a that can be a developmental stage, and that we can work in contributing to help it grow. So thank you so much. This has been a wonderful discussion. Maybe we can have uh, another discussion in the future on the idea of achintatva, what it means and what it does not mean. Mm, yes, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhu. I always appreciate my conversations with you. And this one in particular, I think many wonderful uh, uh, points came out as a result of this discussion, as a result of the dialogue that would not have emerged in a lecture format. So thank you. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.